Stay tuned for the Bulldozer Health Show brought to you by Bulldozer Health Incorporated. The opinions stated on this show are not necessarily those of this station. All listeners should check with a trusted health advisor before following specific medical advice. Hello, my name is Wendy Love Edge, and I'd like to welcome you to the Bulldozer Health Show. In this episode, we're on location in New York, New York, and I'll be interviewing Dr. Eric Eiding, Chair for the Correctional Health Task Force, Physicians for Criminal Justice Reform. Welcome to the show, Dr. Eiding. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. So, Dr. Eiding, you have lots of accomplishments in education, in healthcare, you're a physician. What brought you to wanting to work within the criminal justice system to improve health care? It's a really great question. I spent a lot of my time in training, both in medical school and in residency, working in public hospitals. Um, and I did a fellowship in a public hospital as well. And one of those hospitals actually had a jail ward in it. Um, so we spent a lot of time um, taking care of people who are coming into the correctional system. And it just seemed so obvious to me that there were so many problems. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I think it takes a special person to um, put in the time and effort to try and fix those problems. And that was just something that I really wanted to spend a lot of time doing. I agree with you. It definitely does. Um, so um, what I want to know to start off with is what kind of healthcare is available to people who are incarcerated? So it's it actually it depends on the setting, but in general, there's comprehensive healthcare that is available. Um, it's just that access to that healthcare is a lot more challenging. You can sort of imagine how when every patient encounter is also looked at by correctional officers as a security risk, um, that it just puts a lot more hurdles along the way that, that makes it more challenging to get that health care. Hurdles for the, for the patient, right? Exactly, right. exactly. I was reading an article recently that inmates actually have to pay a copay to access the health care, and yet they're making a very small amount while they're, while they're incarcerated, sometimes 15 cents an hour to 63 cents an hour. So what are your thoughts about that? And it seems like that's one of the hurdles that you're talking about. There are some settings where they do charge a copay for, for patients to access care. Um, the settings where I've worked, that's not been the case. Okay. Um, and it, it's also variable. So sometimes there will be copays, for example, for medications that we would uh, um, have access to over the counter. Um, and so not necessarily something that we traditionally look at is as receiving health care, right. um, but something that is sort of falls outside of the parameters. Right. Because the, the small amount that they make, you know, when you compare what it costs on the outside, let's say um, those things become just unavailable and unaccessible, don't they? Right. I mean, the, the settings where I've worked, because... In the same way that a copay sort of is meant to serve as a bit of a barrier mm -hmm. uh, for you to access health care um, when you're in the community, right. uh, it's it's sort of designed to do the same thing. And that's why the setting where I worked, uh, we've tried to make sure that we're getting rid of some of those barriers Wonderful. and that we're really just focusing on access. And uh, I noticed in your bio, it mentioned that you have set up clinics that are more on site instead of the... Uh, incarcerated patient having to leave the facility, I would imagine that removes some barriers also. Yeah, absolutely. Because you know, one of the one of the biggest challenges is trying to get patients out of the correctional facility, and then it, there's that transit time where you know, they're um, in a, a you know sort of a, a radio car with a sheriff's deputy, right. um, and that poses a, as a, a security risk for, right. for those patients. Right. Do you think some of the barriers that come up are because uh, of the nature of it being a for-profit prison system in this country? They don't want 
the dollars being spent on, on health care for the inmate. And I think that cost is always an issue that that, that gets factored in, into the equation, and, and people are always mindful of cost. And and it's not just the actual cost of healthcare. I think the question is always, what is it that I'm getting with the money that I'm spending? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, uh, some of the decisions that get made um, with respect to healthcare in a correctional setting are actually not happening um, with doctors and, and nurses. They're decisions that are being made by correctional officers, and, and that poses its own set of challenges. Absolutely, right, because it's not a clinical decision then at that point. Exactly, right? exactly. Right. My, my other question is about what is available to the inmates. Are there any complementary treatments that are available, like acupuncture or herbal treatments, massage, you know, those kinds of things that a patient who perhaps may be ill but happens to be in prison um, would help with their health. And it, you're, it's going to vary from site to site. I've worked in places where you know we've had services like physical therapy, occupational therapy. Um, there are certainly places where they'd offer yoga, and not necessarily even as um, something that's looked at or is that's viewed as being healthcare, but just as an activity for okay. for uh, patients to be able to participate while they're there. Um, so there there are things that are available. It really just depends on where what you're at. Correct. Right, right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and what about nutrition? You know, because nutrition is a building block to yeah. health, as I know you're aware. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so, so an, an inmate who is already you know in a small space quite a bit of the time, and um, and and they're really a very susceptible population right. to ill health. Yep. You know, what's what is the food like? And, and that may vary too. But yeah, <laughs> but but it's a pretty common theme, which is that the food is not it's not great. In fact, there are even some. Um, some uh, cookbooks that that um, formerly incarcerated people have have put together and just you know describes um, the types of food that they have available in jails and prisons. Mm -hmm. um, but it's you know it, it, it it's sort of what we would traditionally think of as being you know that very um, you know low cost, heavily processed foods. Mm -hmm. um, it's not uncommon to see uh, patients who spend a lot of time in jail. Uh, to end up gaining weight just because it's it's not the, the diet, food. Exactly. right? Right, the processed diet. Exactly. Well, that's really disheartening. Um, yeah. You know, there's some people out there though who would say, "Well, these people broke the law, so why why should we provide them with something better?" What are your thoughts about that? I mean, I just think that that's not a very health centric approach mm -hmm. to it, and it, it it sort of gets at this issue, I mean, you know, we live in a country where um, we have 5% of the population and 25% of the incarcerated population. Um, and wow. it, right, it's, <laughs> it, it, it really is overwhelming. So, you know, it's, it's clear to me that we take a different approach to incarceration than other countries do. Mm -hmm. um, so to, I think it's really important to focus on trying to take patients who really don't benefit from incarceration at all and just get them out of the right. system. Well, and that brings up another point. So um, I was speaking with a woman recently who did spend some time incarcerated, and she was telling me that at least 90% of the people she met had either a substance abuse issue or a mental health issue. Right. Um, so what are your thoughts about that? Is is this large number of incarcerated people because we're putting people who actually need health care right. <laughs> um, in, in prison? Yeah, I, and you've hit the nail on the head. You know, when it comes to mental health, um, it's it's like we took the the deinstitutionalization movement of the 60s mm -hmm. and we just ended up reinstitutionalizing them only in jails. Um, and so to me, I think it's um, you know, it, it speaks to a, a public health and a public policy failure in this country. Um, what we really need to do is spend more, more time focusing on treating the underlying issues. Um, and that's also why you, you hear a lot of discussion now about um, improving some of the training in our police departments across the country, um, de-escalation, de -escalation, um, crisis intervention training, um, and making sure that our um, frontline officers uh, have a better ability to understand when somebody's having a mental health crisis right. so that we can get those patients into the right setting 
um, nine times out of 10, jail is not the right setting for those patients because it's going to take somebody who's having a mental health crisis and really just make it worse. Right. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I recently spoke at an event about the history of psychiatric care Mm -hmm. and, um, and one of the speakers was talking about the similarity between being an inmate Mm -hmm. and being, being, uh, hospitalized yes right yeah and so there is some parallel there right but the still the incarceration seems like it's not the best choice right yeah i i think that you're absolutely right so and you brought up substance abuse which i think is a, you know an, an, an excellent point and something we spend a lot of time dealing with uh, in jails and prisons in this country uh and and the approach that we've taken you know we've, we've seen um the long-term effects of the war on drugs in this country right um and Again, it's a, it's another issue where we're, there is a big push in in the field of medicine to medicalize substance abuse mm-hmm. um, because it is a disease, and then only when you treat the disease are you going to be able to make it better. Um, one of the things that that is is so striking is we've looked at some of the statistics um, about patients who come into jail with substance abuse, mm-hmm. and it turns out that that their risk. Um, can be anywhere from 20 to 50 times greater in those first two to four weeks after they're released from jail to die because of an overdose. Oh my goodness. So, you know. So something, they're not getting the care that they need. Exactly. In the the prison. Is there any care available? You know, if someone is known to have a substance abuse issue, they end up in prison. What is offered to them to, to help? with the disease yeah and it can be a whole range of treatments and some some places are going to have very limited uh treatment uh, options for somebody with substance abuse disorders but there are some jails and prisons who are doing things like methadone treatment um, for patients who are addicted to opiates um using uh buprenorphine uh, which is a, a, a relatively newer drug or a newer approach um, that, that we're taking to treating opiate addiction um, so we're starting to see more and more of this, and it really is because more and more people are, are 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 finally taking the right approach here and saying this is a disease. We have to treat the disease. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, all we end up having is a this vicious cycle where people just keep coming into and out of. Right, and that was my next question. You know, the recidivism rate right. for people with mental illness also right. yep. um, must be pretty high. Yeah, and uh, again, it's going to vary, you know, uh, based on the location that you're in and the availability of resources um, when patients come out of jail. But we know that access to things like housing, food, employment, mm-hmm. healthcare, um, that if there isn't an infrastructure there, as somebody comes out, um, it, it it only becomes more and more difficult to try and break that cycle. Right, for sure. Whereas if that patient perhaps didn't end up in prison, but went in for some treatment, right, they would have more resources and more people on their team to help them, you know, as they leave. Exactly. Right? Well, and and for example, in in Los Angeles County. Uh, there is a a, a big push to make um, transitional housing available. And the nice thing about this is it's not just that you're able to put somebody into a stable housing situation when they're coming out of jail, Mm -hmm. but you're also able to target some of the resources. So you can go and deploy doctors and nurses and social workers and patient navigators and advocates um, and sort of coalesce all of your resources Mm -hmm. in one area so that you you say, okay, you have mental health issues and let's come up with a regimen. And it's a, you know, you have a complicated disease. So we're going to bring in all of the the providers and all the resources that you need to make that happen. That's amazing. Thank goodness. Maybe that will be a model going forward. Absolutely. (laughs) And that's, and, and I think that that's the hard part. I think that that's where people sort of struggle is that like, there isn't this, um, national model for how you approach um, healthcare in a large urban setting uh, in this country, um, but but there you know there are definitely some locations that are doing some really great impressive stuff. Nice. Yeah. So you touched for a moment on the drug war, and I just wanted to talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. Um, you know, bulldozer health is definitely pro cannabis for patients, mm-hmm. and um, we've seen so many people who have improved in their health, including me, actually. And um, but I know that there are patients in states where it's not legal mm-hmm. and it's not federally legal. Right. Um, patients who have been, um, you know, put in prison, mm-hmm. being found with their medicine, 
Right. And then they don't have access to the medicine. Mm-hmm. You know, what are your thoughts about this and, and just about the, you know, the amount of money that it takes to incarcerate these people who are really just trying to either medicate or right. use it recreationally sometimes? Yeah. So, I mean, it, I think it's such an interesting and fascinating question, right? Because, um, I mean, what, what's clear to me is this, is that, you know, it, 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 we're taking this approach where we're letting states decide um, mm-hmm. what when uh, they think that it may be appropriate to be using cannabis. Um, and, and, you know, California takes a much more medical approach to it, but right. then we're, we're starting to see the experience of Washington State and mm-hmm. Colorado and Washington, D.C., um, where it's, uh, uh, you know, like a broader legalization policy. Sure. And to me, if, you know, if, if the reason why somebody is using uh, any medication, right, whether it's cannabis or what have you, if the reason why um, why somebody is using that is because the, a patient had a conversation with their physician, with their healthcare provider, and the determination was that this was the, the best regimen for them and it's working for them, there's no place for that in the legal system. You know, we, we really need to get away from that. And it, and it's particularly, I know that, that there are, you know, plenty of, of people, even in the medical community, you know, who are torn on, on the issue of cannabis. Um, but, you know, we, we do have some evidence to suggest that there are you know, conditions where it is beneficial. Mm-hmm. And that really should be a discussion that happens between uh, healthcare providers and patients and the legal system is no place. Yeah, thank you so much for saying that. It's true, uh, especially for patients. You know, the full legalization is another issue that perhaps isn't for right. this interview. Sure. But, but on the medical side, it is uh, between patient and doctor. Right. right. If that is the decided therapy of choice. Right. You know, um, so it's it's sad when I see, I see frequently articles about patients. I know last year there was a patient, I believe in Iowa, um, who had terminal cancer mm-hmm. and uh, was arrested and died in prison. And these stories, you know, I, I, I don't know what it's going to take to stop the madness, you know, right. from the drug war that started so long ago. Yeah. You know? Yes. And, and, it, and it is, it's, it, it's, I think it's very challenging. I understand the, you know, the, the thought process behind, you know, tying uh, uh, you know, or criminalizing drug use because, mm-hmm. You know, like that's, the, the, it, it, you know, it, it's something that exists in a black market right. and, you, you know, and, and, and oftentimes there can be crime around this. But, you know, when we're talking about somebody who is, uh, you know, getting a medication from a pharmacy or, you know, wherever right. it is. Right. And, and, and there's no crime that's tied to that at all. I mean, like right. how much more legitimate can you make? Right.
The Food and Drug Administration on their own website states that a drug is a prescription when a medical professional is required to supervise its use because the patient cannot safely use the drug on their own. Why then are drug companies allowed to market directly to the patient? This puts Americans' health at risk every day. Let's fight back and get this public health risk off of television. What happens when someone needs to be hospitalized? They have something, some severe illness, they become very sick in prison. What, what is the process that someone has to go through? So usually um, a, a jail or prison is going to have some kind of financial relationship with uh, a hospital. Um, and they may have, it may be a health network. So it may be a series of doctors that they can use as, you know, outpatient visits. Um, but they're usually going to have a relationship with a hospital. Um, there are actually uh, uh, several hospitals throughout the country that have correctional wards or prison wards um, as, as part of the hospital facility. Um, and it, it's a way to sort of um, create a security, a, a more secure environment in a hospital setting where you have a large amount of, of incarcerated patients. Um, but in general, in, in those hospitals, you're going to see the same services that are available to the community patients are available to incarcerated patients. Um, the logistics just get a little bit more challenging. So, for example, when you have a patient who needs to get a CAT scan, um, they have to have a correctional officer who is escorting them. And, and, and so there, there's some hurdles, but, but it's still, still an option. Is it because the um, prison um, establishment feels that that puts the person at a flight risk once they're in the hospital, even if they're very sick? Yes. They... Yeah, absolutely. And, and it, it, to be honest with you, um, I've um, worked in hospitals where they, you know, that was an attempt to, um, to escape the, oh, really? the facility was, you know, it, um, they uh, actually, they, they build a lot of regulation into, you know, who can and can't know about when a patient goes to a hospital facility. Um, usually um, at the point that a, a patient is admitted, um, most hospitals will have some sort of rules about family members coming to visit them while, while they're in the hospital. Um, but in general, like for example, if a patient has to go to the emergency room to get evaluated, um, that's a period of time where um, they're less likely to be able to, to have any sort of visitation because it usually is a less secure environment um, and, you know, there's more question about how much time the patient will be there. And so there are definitely right. concerns about escape. Well, I'm glad there's access anyway. Yes. You know, for patients if yep. they need it. So. Yeah. And well, and I'm an emergency doctor by training. And so mm -hmm. like, so actually, you know, spending time with, with um, incarcerated patients um, and trying to, you know, figure out if, if they would benefit from being admitted to the hospital is, is actually really interesting. And when we have to make decisions about these patients, um, sometimes it, it's more than just 
um, the acuity of their condition or, um, you know, whether or not, like if they were a community patient, perhaps they wouldn't be hospitalized for the same condition. Mm -hmm. But you have to sort of keep in mind that um, there's just limited ability to provide health care in a correctional setting. Sure. So sometimes the hospital just right. becomes the right place to be able to deliver that health care. Right. So it becomes part of your decision making process. Right. So if they go back to the prison, they're in a small space. Yep. But- you know, and they won't have the same kind of attention. Right, they, or, or it, and it may just be resources, you know, that CAT scan that we talked about, right. you know, like you may not have that available in, in your correctional setting. Sure. And if that's the case, then and you need to, to be able to have access to something like that, then maybe a hospital is the right place for you. Right. Do you have any last thoughts about health in the prisons? I think the number one way to improve health, health care in correctional settings is to take the people who don't belong there in the first place and just mm-hmm. get them out there. Um, but I, I, I think that it is um, a, it's a, a very uh, challenging environment to provide health care, um, but something that's been very rewarding for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, it's given me a way to advocate for my patients in a way that I never thought was really going to be possible. Yeah. Thank you so much for your diligent and fine work on behalf of these patients. Bulldozer Health Incorporated is a 501c3 nonprofit organization and healthcare reform initiative. You can find us at bulldozerhealth.org. Take back your health, America. Expect to be, she returns to me like a wave of pure euphoria that slowly washes over.